recording right now. Everybody should see that. Can you see that I record? Do you get a message for that? Yep, recording has started. Great. So then we, we should start uh, with this session. So hello, good morning, good evening, good night to everyone who's attending. Uh, we are lucky today that we have Alberto Ferrari for our session today. And um, I'm not going to disturb anyone. I will, won't uh, take too much time in the beginning. I just want to say three little things. The first thing is something everybody should see. This session is, is recorded. So if you don't want to be part of this recording, please leave the session now. The second thing is, and uh, this is something I, I ask every speaker in the beginning, should people ask questions uh, at any time or after the talk? Alberto is happy when people ask at any time. And uh, please ask your questions um, and unmute yourself. I won't mute anyone except it disturbs the session. So um, please do that yourself. But uh, mute yourself if you don't say anything and unmute yourself when you want to ask questions. So, so far to the organizational stuff. Um, I think Alberto doesn't need any introduction at all. So, Alberto, the, the stage is yours. Sounds perfect. So, welcome everybody. The topic we're going to cover tonight uh, is uh, relationships in Power BI. I mean, uh, everybody knows what a relationship is. So, uh, we're not going to tell uh, all the details. Nevertheless, I will provide first a very, very short introduction uh, just to set up the common ground about what relationships are. And then we will see some details because uh, tabular and DAC, with tabular and with DAX, uh, the problems are all in the details. So, so there are some important aspects that are worth uh, uh, understanding about the relationships. Before that, uh, just a few words about myself, uh, really, really short. I'm Alberto Ferrari. I, what I do is basically I'm a teacher. I, I teach courses. So we do consultancy at SQL BI. We write books. Uh, the Definite Guide to DAX uh, is, uh, well, it's the book about DAX. If you want to learn all the details about this language, that's great. And then we do courses. Uh, we do training. Uh, we do sometimes also consulting. Nevertheless, I'm not here to sell myself. Uh, the topic of today is uh, relationships. Uh, so the agenda is basically basic concepts about relationships uh, with our cardinality, cross-filter direction. And then uh, once we have set up very quickly this background, uh, we talk about what happens when you have uh, invalid relationships. Uh, so if you have a relationship that is not always satisfied, uh, something weird happens with the blank row and uh, doing calculations in this scenario is uh, really challenging. Uh, then we talk about ambiguity. Uh, I don't know how many of you use bidirectional cross filter, but I will basically tell you what I repeat all the time. Uh, bidirectional cross filter is the devil. You should stay away from it because it's uh, bad and there are no really good things about it. And finally, we talk about uh, weak relationships. If you are interested in the demo file, send uh, the slides. Uh, there is a QR code on the screen. If you take a picture of that, that will drop you to uh, a web page that contains uh, the demo files, uh, the PDF of the slides, and all the content that you can use uh, to test by yourself. The main takeaway of the entire session is uh, tabular, DAX. They contain a lot of features. So those features are good. They work well, but you need to know exactly what you are doing. If you don't understand fully some technology or some detail about the language, stay away from it because uh, not knowing the detail is just extremely dangerous. And that's why I will start slowly by setting up the correct background for uh, talking about relationships. So what is a relationship? Well, a relationship is basically a link between two tables. So in the picture you see we have product, we have sales, uh, and uh, there is a relationship that is uh, linking them. The relationship have uh, a direction. We have uh, the source of the relationship, sales in this case, and the related table, which is product. Relationship have a direction. I typically say that the relationship starts from sales and goes to uh, product. And you can either use an arrow to picture it, or you use uh, the star and the one symbol as Power BI is doing. 
The star and the one symbol that are highlighted right now, they are the cardinality of the relationship. There is a many side and the one side. The source is typically the many side and the target, uh, the related table is the one side. The easiest way to read it is that uh, there is one product, that's why it's on the one side, and there are many sales for the same uh, product. Uh, whereas when you are on the sale table, there is only one product on the, other, on the other side. That's why we call them the one and the many side. And finally, there is uh, this tiny, tiny arrow in the middle of a relationship that is the cross filter direction. That indicates how the filter context moves through relationship, meaning that if you place a filter on the product table, the filter will reach sales because the arrow points from product to sales. You can make this arrow point both ways so that the filter goes both directions, and that is bad. You will never do that unless you really have a strong need for that. Where is my mouse? I lost it. So cardinality can be one. On the one side of the relationship, the column need to have unique values. If you want to have a one side, you need to have a column with unique values. That's what we call typically a primary key in uh, databases. Uh, that's the target of table expansions. We will not talk about table expansions, but it's useful to know uh, that expansion goes from the main to the one side, whereas it's the source for the filter context propagation. A filter context placed on the one side automatically goes on the many side. On the many side, on the other hand, sales, just to be sure, to be clear, the column may, may and typically has a lot of duplicates. It's the source of table expansion and is the target for the filter context propagation. The cross filter direction, two values it can be sync, which is the standard, the default way of propagating a relationship. So the filter context goes from the one to the many side by default. It's the default behavior and it's safe, it always works, it's faster, it's the best thing that you can have. You can also enable bidirectional cross filter. If you do that, then the filter context propagates both ways. It looks totally cool when you're a new buy, but it's, uh, it's really unsafe. It's dangerous, it creates a lot of issues. So you activate bidirectional cross filter only if you really, really need to do that. Otherwise, you try to stay as away from it as much as you can. And then there are three kinds of relationships that we will discuss. One to many, the standard relationship between product and sales, one product, many sales. Then you might have both sides of the relationship to be the one side, and then you have a one to one relationship. It's not very common. It happens when uh, the column has unique values in both sides of the relationship. It's not very common because most of the times, uh, if not all the time that I see a one-to-one -one relationship, uh, there is a problem with the data model. A one-to-one -one relationship basically is just one table split into two parts, but it's really one table. Uh, so if it happens that you have a one-to-one -one relationship, uh, it's very, very likely that you can merge these two tables into a one table at the ETL steps and present to your user a much better data model. In that case, and it's the only scenario where it happens, table expansion goes both ways, and the cross filter direction need to be both because the, the engine really optimizes one to one relationship, considering them as if they were the same table. And finally, the latest kind of relationship that has been introduced in Tabular are weak relationships. Weak relationships are, I don't know if they are worse than bidirectional cross filter, but they are really close to that. The weak relationship can be created in the engine. In the case of the two tables, both contain duplicates in the key that you use to link the two tables. Uh, sometimes they talk about weak relationship as many-to-many -many relationship. There are, have nothing to do with many-to-many -many relationship. Weak relationship have many-to-many -many cross filter, meaning that both sides of the relationship is the many side. No date, no table expansion happens. You will need to decide which direction the cross filter need to go, and they are extremely dangerous because uh, uh, they are slow, first of all, they are getting faster over time, so the first version was really slow. Now they are getting a bit better because they improve them a lot, but they are dangerous because the filter uh, moves in the two direction using the cardinality of the column, so it's really hard to understand the numbers that come out. Nevertheless, let's start looking at uh, uh, 
some more details about the relationships because uh, the first topic, uh, the first, I think, interesting topic that is worth uh, understanding is uh, the blank row. Now, imagine that we have a table like the one you see on the screen. We have uh, just two columns. This is a sales table containing some data. We have amount and product key. And the question is, how many values uh, does amount has? We know we have six rows and we have six distinct values. Therefore, we have just uh, six rows and six distinct values. And the product ID, well, there we have again six rows, but we only have five values because three is repeated a couple of times. So far, everything is nice. The thing is, if we have a product ID, then it's likely we want to create also a product table and link the two tables through a relationship. You can easily tell we are Italian, but what we consider a product, coffee, pasta, and tomato, and everything else doesn't matter. The problem of this relationship is that uh, the first few rows in sales, uh, they work just fine. It's one, two, three, three, and the values in the product ID are represented correctly in the product table. But for the last two rows, we are in trouble because we, have, we are storing in the product ID values, uh, which are not represented anywhere in the product table. There is no product name, no product with code four, and there is no product with code five. So what is the engine expected to do at this point? Uh, there are choices. So the engine needs to take a choice. And the real question that uh, the DAX engineer had to answer is what happens if I slice by product and I compute the sum of amount? Because of the direction of the relationship, a filter on product is propagated to the sales table. So if I look at coffee, I will only see 25. And if I look at pasta, I will only see 12.50. Tomato will show the sum of 225 and 250. And what happens to the 30, now the value of amount 30 that happens to be related to no product? Should I hide it? Should I consider the model as invalid and reject it? Or what else? Well, rejecting the model uh, would be a beautiful choice. Very strong, very strict, uh, but a bit too strong because invalid relationship can be controlled as long as the data model are created by professionals. But nowadays with Cell Service BI, everybody builds data model and you can make sure that in Cell Service BI, invalid relationships are an everyday thing. They happen to be everywhere. So they could not reject the model. Uh, can you hide those values because they are not referenced to any product then you don't show them? That's again another option, but it doesn't work too because uh, that means that depending on the dimension I use to slice my data, I will see different totals. I will see the total of uh, only three products if I slice by product, but if I slice by customer and customer has a different set of relationships, then I will see a grand total, which is different. So they couldn't choose any of uh, these two and they went for a third option. The third option is uh, to say, well, if uh, the relationship is invalid, I create a new row in the product table that contains blank everywhere. And once that row is in place, uh, I relate all the invalid rows to the blank row. That way, when you slice by product, you will see coffee, pasta, tomato, and then a blank row. The blank row really does not exist in the data model. There is no product which is blank, but is needed to accumulate values which are linked to uh, non-existent products. That way, that $30 will be accumulated under the blank row. The presence of the blank row happens as soon as you have an invalid relationship. And unfortunately, the presence of the blank row creates a lot of issues to calculations if you do not pay attention to this more detail. Let's take a look with uh, a simple demo. In uh, this model, I'm slicing by brand, I have uh, the sales amount, uh, I have the product sold, uh, and uh, I am just computing the distant count of products. So 159 products uh, produce this value for the sales amount. Product sold, uh, I honestly don't remember, but I guess it's just uh, the distant count of product key. Yeah. So everything is working fine. And then I created uh, a, cal a measure, all colors. Uh, that does a count rows of all product color. This is just useful to see, let's keep it there, how many distinct colors we do have in, uh, the, in the model right now. 
everything is working fine so far. There is nothing strange and nothing interesting to look at. But focus on this, we have 16 colors. What happens if I change the relationship and I modify it? So if I go to my data model and I take the relationship between sales and product that now is valid, so every row in sales points to a correct product, what happens if I break it, if I remove some products? We can do that in order to generate the blank row what i need to do is just uh, remove that happened in the wrong place let's go here i just need to go to the product and uh, for example kill one color let's kill white i go here text filter and i want all the rows that are not white now it's time for you to think a bit i had 16 colors earlier as soon as I click on close and apply, white will disappear. So how many colors will remain in the number of available color? That's not hard. It's 16 minus 1, which equals to 16. Exactly. It's not 15. It is still 16. But white is no longer there. So what happened? Well, what happened? You can see it here. We have this new row blank that appears that was not here before. And if you look at the product table, there is no product which is blank. So we can go in the product table, go to the brand, sort it alphabetically, ascending. You see that the first one is eight atom. There is no product with a blank brand. Still, my report shows the blank brand. And that is the blank row that suddenly appeared in my model. By itself, the blank row is not bad. It just accumulates values that uh, they have no other place. So you need a place to store those values, and Power BI shows them using the blank row. The problem of the blank row is when you do some calculations. Let's say that taking the, num the sales amount and the product sold, uh, what I want to do is compute uh, the average sales per product. So I have, uh, 400, I have 124 products here. 3 million is the total sales. What is the average sales per product? Well, you, compute, you can compute this value in a lot of different ways. And uh, well, the number will quite always be wrong, depending and for most important different, depending on the calculation you do. Let's say that we want to compute the uh, average per product, average per product. How can I compute that? Well, I can divide uh, the sales amount by the number of products. Or let's make it divide sales amount by count rows of product. So I'm taking the sales amount and I'm divided by the number of products. That's an option. I obtain a number. I only need to format it as the decimal number. Sorry, I guess you no longer see my screen, right? No, we don't see your screen. Exactly, it's I made totally some black mistake. Black. Exactly, now it's back. Yeah. Uh, so that's a way of computing the average. And that produces a number. Let's not focus on what happens here. We can also get rid of the brand. So we just focus on the total. This is telling me that the average sales per product is 15,000. That's an option. There's another way of computing this average, which is to say, well, I know iterators, so I can create a new measure. Let's call it average two, which does an average X over products of sales amount. And the question is, is it going to be different than earlier? Theoretically, the number should be the same. But if I put this measure in the report, average two, the average two is different, has, produces a different number. Average two, let me format it as a decimal number. And let me put this a bit down so we see both values. You see, average product is 15,000, average two is 13,000 which is correct and why. 
actually none of them is right. And to understand it, what we need to do is uh, look at uh, uh, the individual numbers. The total I have here, I have here is 15,000. The total here is 13,000. Both they produce a blank for the blank row. Why they do? Well, average product right now is dividing sales amount by count rows of product. Count rows of product does not count the blank row. Even though the blank row is there in the product table, count rows does not find it. So count rows will produce a blank and this average will be blank, produces a number which is wrong. Average two, well, average two, where is it? Averages over product. During the iteration over product, is it iterating also on the blank row or not? That's an interesting question. I know the answer. The answer is no. If you only scan the product table, you will not see the, pro the blank row. Therefore, the number will be wrong. The average you are computing is not taking into account the, the blank row. How can you enforce a scan in the blank row too? Well, you can use values of product. If you use values of product instead of a product, then the blank row appears and you will see that the number now appears and this value is again different than earlier. Is it correct? Unfortunately, the answer is still no, it is not. Because uh, it looks like uh, the blank product, there is only one blank product, accumulates a sales for 5 million. But we know it's not actually 5 million because there are 452 products all linked to the same individual product. So all the averages we computed so far, they are basically all wrong. And the reason is that nasty blank row. If you want a better approximation of uh, your calculation, you need to do a distinct count of the sales product key. If you do a distinct count of product key, then this number becomes different. It's 4,400. No, sorry. I corrected the wrong one. So let me uh, average two. That should be sales amount. And it is still wrong. What I needed to, cor to fix is average prod. That divides sales amount not by account rows of product, but the distinct count of sales product key. Right now, that uses the distinct count is the best approximation of the average sales per product. The thing is, you need to know that in order to do the right calculation in case there is a blank row, so in case your relationship is invalid. Knowing, not knowing about the existence of the, blank re, of the blank row or not knowing what happens if you have invalid relationship uh, leads to calculations that are extremely hard to compute and extremely hard to justify for users. So the best thing that you can do is uh, just stay away from invalid relationships. That would be your best option because uh, in that case you will not see any blank row. If we remove invalid relationships, all these calculations will, will produce the very same result. But in the presence of invalid relationship that unfortunately, are, as I said, is an everyday thing, then these things might happen. And uh, you create a calculation that looks right from a theoretical point of view, and it proves to be wrong just because of the presence of the blank row. Now, let's completely change topic. Let me go back the slides, so there it is. Uh, I just need to click a while because I need to skip all this. This is just uh, slides that give you, uh, I use as a recap, but I'm using a lot of time, so I skip recap and I go a bit slower. Another important topic regarding relationships are dependencies. Dependencies, uh, I don't know how many of you create a relationship on calculated columns, but it's a powerful feature that of being able to create a relationship based on a calculated column. Performance wise, uh, calculated relationships or so relationship based on calculated columns are great, but they hide some uh, nasty details. Again, 
linked to the blank row. Let's see the reason why. And uh, I prefer to see that with uh, the demo machine. I only need to get rid of this and instead take the calculated relationship demo. OK, in this model, I have sales and I have a table that right now is disconnected, it's price ranges. Now, price ranges is a table that contains a configuration, it's a configuration table. So if I look at price ranges, it, uh, it is useful to uh, group products based on price range. So all the, pro all the products that have a price between 0 and 10, they need to be ranked very low. All the products between 10 and 30, they need to be ranked low. Between 30 and $80, their ranking in price should be medium. And uh, I want to build a relationship between sales and this table based on the price range key. I could do that with ETL, but since I like to do that, I mean, I love DAX, I prefer to do that in DAX. So it's more dynamic and it's computing without having to worry about SQL stuff. So I can create a calculated column in sales that computes the price range key. And computing the column by itself is not hard. You can go in sales, create a new column, a bit larger than that. And say, well, what I want to do is the price range key. And I use a calculator. Well, I need a variable current price, which is sales net price. And then I compute the values of price ranges, price range key, and I apply a filter on the price ranges to show the only row where the price range in mean price is uh, less than the current price. And at the same time, the price ranges uh, max price is greater or equal to the current price. So what this expression is doing is basically saying, well, go search in the price ranges table for the only row that have the boundaries, including the current price, uh, apply that as a filter to the model and then give, then give me back the price range key. So the final calculation produces a column that contains one, two, three, depending on the net price. If we go to different net prices, let's sort it. The sending, you see that we have five for the very expensive prices and we have only one for the lowest one with all the numbers represented in between. My goal is now to build a relationship based on this price range key with the price ranges table. And that should work because uh, despite being a calculated column, there is nothing that prevents me from doing it. The problem is that when I try to build the relationship, I find this nasty error. I don't know how many times you have seen it, uh, but when you start playing with relationship and calculated relationship, it happens a lot. And it's one of the worst error messages that I, ha I have ever seen because it basically says a circular dependency was detected and that's the entire set of help I can give you, nothing else. Then you are on your own, find it by yourself. This nasty uh, useless QID does not tell you anything about where the problem is. Now, understanding uh, the problem is much harder than fixing it. So we need to spend time understanding why the problem happens. A circular dependency happens whenever you have two expressions that depend one from the other. So what is the meaning of the dependency? Let's look at the code of the price range key. Price range key, here, price range key. Price range key depends from uh, sales net price, meaning that when the net price changes, we need to recompute this column, of course. And then because it filters the price ranges table, again, price range key depends from any change in the value of the price ranges table. So it depends from the entire price ranges table. Remember, depends from means uh, any change in price ranges requires me to recompute the price range key calculated column. So for sure, if I change the configuration table, I will need to recompute the calculated column. Therefore, you can say that price range key depends from price ranges. 
Now, in order for a circular dependency to be present, uh, there is also the need that the price range is stable depends on the price range key. And that dependency happens only when I build the relationship. Now, how is it the case that uh, when I create the relationship, price ranges depends on price range key? Meaning that a change, an update to the price range key value requires me to recompute the price ranges table. There is no expression in price ranges that references price range key. I just created this calculated column. The thing is the blank row. If price range key contains a value that is not present anywhere in the price ranges table, then the content of price ranges need to be updated, adding to it the blank row. If on the other hand, <clears throat> all the values in price range key are correctly represented, then no blank row is needed. And uh, this is the circular dependency. Price ranges depends from price range key because of the blank row. You can see that uh, in the slides, if only I find the slides, because uh, uh, you have sales price ranges and you have one dependency that says that the price range key depends because of the DAX code from price ranges, but at the same time, price ranges depends on price range key because of the blank row. So in such a scenario, you cannot create the relationship and there would be no way unless the engineer said, well, you know what? In order to make it possible to create calculated columns and cal as a foundation of a relationship, we will create two chains of duration, two chains of dependencies, one for the blank row and one for the DAX code. So as long as the DAX code of price range key does not depend in any way from the presence of the blank row, you would be able to make the relationship. The thing is, where is my code? dependent on the blank row. Values is a function that returns the values of a column. Does value return the blank row? The answer is yes. If price range key contains a blank row, values does return it. So we would need a function that returns the same result as values, but does not return the blank row. And we have one, which is distinct. If instead of using values, here you use distinct, the code is absolutely identical. There is no difference. The numbers will be totally the same because values and distinct, they compute the same stuff. The only difference being that distinct does not return the blank row, values does. But if I use distinct, I obtain the same calculation, then I can go back to my report and say, hey, I want to create the relationship between these two tables. And now it works. It works because now the two chains of dependencies are no longer the same. Therefore, whatever happens uh, in uh, at the blank row in price ranges, I will not need to recompute the value of price range key and vice versa. Again, the blank row, the, pre the potential presence of uh, the blank row creates issues uh, that are really hard to solve unless uh, you remember that uh, the, the blank row might be there. Solving the problem is as easy as using this in, instead of values. The thing is that you need to know it in order to fix it. Before, it looks like a nightmare or a bug or whatever. Actually, it's just that you still don't understand all these nasty details. Now, let's go back to the slide to make a quick recap. Circular dependency always happens when you have a dependency from the blank row and from uh, the DAX code. Fixing them, it's not hard. You need to use all instead of, you need to use, sorry, all no blank row instead of all. You need to use this thing instead of using values. You might have calculate filters that are hiding references to all that again uh, create problems of circular dependencies. So whenever you create calculated tables or calculated columns, if you think that at some point they might be involved in relationship, try to pay attention to the function you use in order to avoid the dependency from the blank row. And then there is another topic that I honestly love that is ambiguity. Ambiguity has to do with uh, bidirectional cross filter. And uh, I, understanding what ambiguity is, uh, is easy. 
when you build a relationship between two tables, you cannot create an ambiguous model. So you cannot create a two relationship between sales and data. Power BI will let you create the first relationship and activate it. But if you try to create a second relationship, it will force it to be deactivated. The reason is uh, uh, if both relationships are active at the same time, you would create an ambiguous model. And uh, nobody likes ambiguity because uh, when you filter by year in the date table, which of the two relationships are you expected to use? If both are active, you are in trouble. And that's the reason why you can have only one relationship active. Nevertheless, it's very easy to introduce ambiguity by changing models or by doing bad things. And again, I want to show you with a demo. So let me go to another demo. If only I find it, it's ambiguity. Here it is. Now, let's quickly take a look at this model. This model is a, a star schema. We have sales, we have purchases, <clears throat> and then we have product, dimension, date, sales and purchases are two fact tables, and we have customer. Customer is linked to sales and not to purchases, of course. And right now, it's just a perfect star schema. Based on this model, I created a report. It's not very nice, but I'm not good at building reports. Uh, that is showing uh, the customer name, a slicer for the color, so I can filter only gold or filter only brown. Uh, and then this is showing me by brand the sales amount. What happens is, is that if I filter by name, you see that Stephanie Adams bought uh, two brands and she probably didn't buy all the colors, but I don't see from here the colors that she bought. I would be able to see the colors in this report. If uh, instead of the brand, I use the color, I will quickly discover that actually Stephanie only bought black and silver, but the slicer is not enforcing it. And the same for all the other customers. You see that uh, they didn't buy all the colors, but the slicer still shows uh, all the colors. Why is that? Well, that's because of the, relation, the direction of uh, relationships. If we go back to the model, you see that uh, a filter on customer, our Stephanie, reaches sales because it goes from one to many. But then from sales, it will not go to product because that is many to one. And you see this tiny arrow is indicating that uh, the filter context goes from product to sales, but it doesn't go from sales to product. And that's my problem. What if I want to move the filter from customer to product? Well, there's an easy solution. I have the power of bidirectional cross filter. So I can go here, double click on it and say, hey, I want the relationship instead of being single to be bidirectional. I click OK. And Power BI does not complain about anything. Everything is just fine. Keep in mind that Power BI would complain if the model you end up creating becomes ambiguous. If, for example, you activate also this relationship, you get this yellow message that says, hey, you can't. There's no way you can build a relationship because the model would become ambiguous. But it didn't complain here. And my report is nice. You see that now, if no filter happens, I see all the colors. And if I go to Stephanie again, the slicer is now showing only black and silver. So my users are totally happy. But there is an interesting question that we need to answer, which is, uh, is this model ambiguous or not? I gave you a few seconds to think about it. And uh, the answer is not easy. Power BI didn't think that the model was ambiguous. So from the Power BI point of view, this model is just fine. Nevertheless, and for that, I want to use the slides. I only need to go in the right place. OK. You see, this in this model, I have uh, this relationship that is bidirectional. And the question is whether this model is ambiguous or not. At first sight, it doesn't look at. But if you carefully look at the date and purchases, you will notice that there are actually 
two different paths that link date and purchases. The first one is a stride. From date to purchases, there is a direct relationship. There is a second path, which is a bit more hidden because date can filter sales. Then from sales, I can go to product because I have that bidirectional filter set. And from product, I can go to purchase again. So there are actually two different paths between date and purchases. And the model is ambiguous. Nevertheless, Power BI didn't consider it ambiguous. Why? The reason is uh, easy to, to spot. The reason is that we have two paths, but one is much shorter than the other one. We have a stride relationship here from date to purchases, and we have a much longer path that goes from sales to purchase, go through sales, product, and purchases. Therefore, there is one that is called the preferred path, the path that, that the engine likes it better that goes straight and the engine will always choose that path instead of the longer one. Nevertheless, our model is a bit more complex than only four tables. You might remember that we had a fifth table, customer. It was not there by chance. There was a reason for this. And the reason why it was there is because uh, uh, as soon as you add more tables, the model becomes much harder to understand. Try to answer some simple questions. First of all, I don't want that. Does date filter sales? Well, date is here, sales is here. There is a straight relationship. So yes, the answer is yes. Does customer filter purchases? Well, customer is here, customer goes to sales, then sales because of the bidirectional cross filter goes to product and product goes to purchases. So yes, customer filter purchases. I hear some sound that might be somebody asking a question. Was there any question asked? I haven't seen that. No, I didn't hear no? anyone. Okay, no. uh, we're just hearing some beep. Maybe somebody else calling on Teams or some question. Anyway, you appeared on the screen right now. Okay. So customer filters purchases. Next question is, uh, does date filter purchases? And we already know the answer. Yes, we have a straight relationship here. So date filter purchases through relationship, through the direct relationship. But now for the most complex one. Imagine you build a report that contains uh, the customer continent on the rows and the year on the columns. So we have a filter on customer and the filter on date, both at the same time. Which subset of sales filters purchases? What do I mean by that? Well, date filters purchases, but date also filters sales. Sales gets a filter from customer too. So these two tables filter sales, and then sales will filter purchases. But which of the two relationships do we use? The one from date to purchases or the one from date to sales or both of them at the same time? So is the engine going to ignore this relationship because it is using the right, the straight one or not? That's not an easy question to answer. And uh, I wanted to find an answer to that because honestly, I didn't know when I first saw this model for the first time. So I created the three calculation. I created the report that slices by customer and by data, and I computed three measures. One is just the sum of purchase, purchases amount, the number without touching anything. The second, re, the second measure disables uh, this relationship. So it disables uh, the relationship between date and sales. So I force the engine to go the straight path, the shortest one. And the third measure disables this relationship. So I force the engine to go for the longest path. And I was expecting two of these measures to be the same. Instead, what I obtained was this beautiful report. And the reason why this report is beautiful is because it's showing the three calculation. And it's not important to look at the numbers. It's not important to understand the, all the details. The only important and relevant thing is that the numbers are all different. 
none is equal to the other. Look at the totals here. They are the same here, but the numbers in between, they are not the same. And the total here is not the same total here, and the numbers in between, they do not like, they are not like this and like those. They are all different. So we know how this calculation happens and how this calculation happens because we manually disable some relationship. But what about this? What is the number that is being computed here? Not only we don't have a clear picture of it, at least we know in this very specific model that it's actually using both relationship at the same time. It's using date and customer to filter sales and then sales will filter purchases, but at the same time, it is using date to filter purchases. So <coughs> all the relationships are being used together in order to build uh, the filter. But when your customer will call you saying, uh, hey, I don't actually understand what this number represents, do you really feel confident in telling him exactly how that number is being computed? To me, it's a nightmare. And the reason why it's a nightmare is because you enabled just one bidirectional relationship in what was earlier a pure star schema. That's the reason why I don't like bidirectional cross filter, because you enable by die and you might turn on ambiguity in a model that by itself was a perfect model. As soon as you enable bidirectional cross filter, you need to make sure that ambiguity appears nowhere. And it's not easy to spot. Remember that with five tables, uh, spotting ambiguity was not that easy. For humans, it's very, very hard to find it. And uh, the real world is actually quite different. When I was presenting this topic for the first time, a guy came to me saying, hey, I have this model that is computing uh, wrong values uh, and I don't understand exactly where the problem is. So I looked at the model and I st just started to count uh, the number of bidirectional cross filter that were present in the model. And I'm highlighting them in uh, with red dots uh, while we talk. All those relationships were bidirectional. Now, what can you tell to the guy that tells you, I don't understand exactly what is being computed here. You say, hey, my friend, here's my shoulder. Come, let's cry together. Because that model can compute whatever. There are some relationships which are not that complex. This one, for example, that happens at the end of the chain of relationship. And even though you enable by die there, you're not creating too much damage. But what about this bidirectional? These, uh, enables bidirectional here, and then this relationship through another bidirectional goes here, and this relationship goes here through another bidirectional goes back to the original table. I honestly have no idea how the engine is going to work in such a scenario. So the thing about bidirectional cross filter is uh, if you need it, then you use it. But you really need to have a strong, compelling reason to use it. Otherwise, stay away from it because it's dangerous. It's uh, extremely easy to build a model that can compute whatever you want. And it's really hard to explain to your users or your customers what number is being computed by your calculate, by your, your measure. Uh, this ambiguation rule, by the way, has never been published. Uh, I, I saw them, we discussed them with the team, uh, and they're really complex and really hard to understand up to a point uh, that to me, it's better not to tell anything. and tell people to stay away from bidirectional cross filter because that is the safest thing that you can do. The last topic that I want to cover, and I still have just time to discuss it briefly, are weak relationships. Now, weak relationship uh, had to be introduced in uh, at the end of 2019 uh, because uh, uh, we had composite models. A composite model is a model that has some data stored in the VertiPack engine, and then it has a relationship between tables in the VertiPack engine, but then you can also load in the same model some direct query data set. So you have the VertiPack continent that contains the data, and then a different island, a different connection to different SQL servers that contain different set of data. All the relationships that are created inside of the continent, they are strong relationships, uh, meaning that the engine is able to check for the need of the blank row. It checks for the validity of the relationship. It checks that everything is working fine. 
But what if you create a relationship between a table in the continent, so in Vertipack, and the table in an island in SQL Server? In that case, Power BI has no way, not only Power BI, Tabular has no way to enforce that the relationship actually stands, that the values are represented correctly. It cannot create a blank row. There's no way for the engine to understand whether the relationship is a one-to-many, one-to-one. There's no way to check because Power BI does not have access to the data which is in the island. And you can create a relationship across island in many different ways. Because of this, Power BI team had to create a special code in order to handle scenarios where uh, the relationship might be uh, might not be checked. And they created weak relationship. Since the code was there, they said, well, let's make it possible to create weak relationship also in the continent. What makes a weak relationship unique is the fact that a weak relationship links to tables and the engine has no guarantee of the uniqueness of the column in both tables. So weak relationships are able to work even when the column in both, on both sides of the relationship is not the one side. And you can create weak relationships also in Power BI using just the continent. As usual, I prefer to show that with Power BI than to go on talking. Okay, in this model, I have uh, sales, I have a budget table, and uh, the budget uh, contains data at the brand level and at the country region level. So the relationship between sales and product is made uh, with uh, the product key. Product key is unique in the product table. Budget, uh, budget doesn't have the product key but it has the brand. The problem of brand is that it is not unique in brand in the budget and it is not unique in product. This operation creating a relationship between the two tables, uh, you couldn't do that up to a few months ago. Uh, I would say a year ago. Today you can. Today you can create a relationship that has a cardinality many to many. This is what I don't like because uh, it's true that it's a many-to-many -many cardinality, but it is not a many-to-many -many relationship. It's only that both sides are the many side. The engine cannot guarantee uniqueness of the column in both sides of the relationship. It's, uh, it starts by default as a bidirectional cross filter, and uh, the engine tells you with a yellow warning that this relationship has cardinality many-to-many, -many, and then a beautiful error message. Uh, this should only be used if it is the expected that neither column contains unique values. That's fine, we know that. And that the significantly different behavior of many-to-many -many relationship is understood. Now, if I were a regular user, I would see a yellow warning that I don't understand. What do you do when you see a yellow warning message that you don't understand? You click OK. That's exactly what I'm doing. I just click OK and say, well, whatever, it will work. And actually it works. You see, it creates a, what is known as a, uh, to me is a relationship I personally hate, both sides are the many side and by default is bidirectional, meaning that budget filters product and the product filters budget. If I click it on it again, you can actually choose the direction, which you should do. I want product to filter budget. I don't want budget to filter product. So let's go at least remove the many-to-many. -many. Now it's a regular many-to-many -many relationship. The problem with many-to-many -many relationships, not with many-to-many cross-filter weak relationships, I call them weak relationships, it's shorter, is that weak relationships do not have the same rules of regular relationships. In weak relationships, the blank row will not be created because the engine has no way. It's not that it has no way. It, it is not expected that it guarantees the uniqueness of data. And so look what happens when we slice the data. If I slice by product brand and if I slice by budget brand, everything is working fine right now. The numbers are the same and I see the value of the budget and the value of the budget slicing by both columns. But the reason is that right now the relationship is correct. 
what if I create a new column? Let me do that. I want to break the relationship. And in order to break the relationship, I need to introduce a, a brand that does not exist. So let me kill Italy. I create a new column. Or let's kill Contoso because I'm working with the brand. Uh, I create a new column, new brand. That says uh, if brand equals Contoso, then we create a new brand that I do not exist. Otherwise, we we'll put the budget brand. The purpose of this column is only to create a new column that has the same value as the brand, but that makes uh, Contoso disappear and creates a I do not exist brand that does not exist in the product table. Then I go here and I change the relationship. Instead of using budget brand, I use new brand. So now I broke the relationship. I click OK. I go back on my report and look what happens. If I slice by budget brand, I see some data, including Contoso. But if I slice by product brand, where's Contoso here? It's no longer, it's not anywhere. The total is the same. The individual numbers, they are the same, but I have a row here that does not appear anywhere here. And the reason is I created an invalid relationship using a weak relationship. And because of that, the blank row did not appear. And what I'm seeing here is the bad behavior that they tried to remove at the very beginning with the blank row. Depending on the dimension or the column I use to do the slicing, I see different values. So I see rows or I don't see them depending on the column that I use. That is a really bad behavior. If you ever plan to use weak relationship, you need to pay attention to that. You need to pay attention to the fact that uh, the relationship needs to stand valid and uh, you need to, to write ETL code to guarantee that everything works fine. Otherwise, uh, numbers will be off. And trust me, if you produce uh, this report and you make a total, a full brand disappear without uh, any good reason, you will just go crazy trying to fix the problem and make it work. So weak relationships, they are powerful, they are useful, but they are dangerous. And uh, weak relationship appear not only when um, you create a relationship uh, using many-to-many -many cardinality, but also when you create uh, any relationship between continent and between different continents. All the red relationships here are weak. So you cannot expect that the blank row to be there and you cannot expect uh, the rules of relationships to be enforced because the engine has no way of enforcing them. And I run out of my time, which is good because uh, it ended exactly where I wanted. I only need to stop here, skip a couple of slides and go to the conclusion. The slides I'm skipping, they only contain exactly what I told you. I always use slides to recap the topics. So let's go to a conclusion. Standard relationships, one to many, they are fast. They are good, they work fine, they work well and life is good with them. As soon as you, you move to different kind of relationship, like calculated relationship, you need to pay attention to important details. If you use bidirectional cross filter, then you are basically opening the door of hell and you are ready to jump into it because uh, a lot of bad things can happen because of ambiguity. Performance wise, bidirectional cross filter are slow. Again, they're getting faster over time, but they are still much slower than one to many. But my issue is not with speed. That the real problem is ambiguity. You need to know that and be aware of uh, be aware of it. Weak relationship, well, they're even more dangerous. It's very easy to build a weak relationship between two tables. Uh, look at numbers, uh, and they are off. But they are wrong. They are not moving uh, the right way. And the reason is uh, the weak relationship. For a relationship to stand right, uh, one of the column need to have unique values. Uh, if that is not the case. Uh, Write ETL, write check, check your code, make sure that everything works right, fine, right, works the right way. And beware, I'm not here to tell you these are features that you should avoid. These are powerful features. They are extremely powerful. Because they are powerful, you should stay away from them unless you need them. 
because being powerful, they are also complex. And if you don't understand the, the consequences of using these features, it's extremely easy to be in trouble much sooner than you would expect and compute numbers that are completely off. So use them if you master them, stay away from them if uh, you are just new to Power BI and uh, you don't want to spend your time debugging code that uh, will drive you just crazy. And that was the last slide. Last thing that I want to tell you is thank you a lot for having attended the session. You will find uh, at the QR code uh, the demo files if you want to play with them or if you want to recap what we say with the slides. And uh, that's all folks for tonight. At that point, Lars is expected to come back. <laughs> I'm, I'm back again. And I never really left. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. I think it was a great ride through this very important but also complex topic. Um, do you have questions, guys and girls? I haven't heard any. Yes, please. Yeah, please. Can I have a question? Sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Hi. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for this uh, excellent uh, webinar. This is Michael Esparver from Israel. I have a question, Alberto. Yep. Uh, when, you, when you talked about ambiguity, you mentioned that you've built two measures that you've disabled the existing relationship. Yeah, you want to see the measures. Is, yes, in measures, exactly. So my question is, how did you do this? By using all um, in your uh, filters? Yeah, you can either use all. Uh, that's the wrong model, sorry. Ambiguity, here it is. Uh, let me see. I don't remember where those measures are, so I need to find them. It's, it's this example. Yeah, no, the example is right, uh, but that's one of the drawback of having too many monitors. You never find the mouse, uh, and uh, since I'm broadcasting, oh, every monitor is showing filter. the same. Yeah, you see that I disabled through cross filter the relationship, so that is computing. Parches is using a cross filter. The other one is using cross filter none. And uh, this Parches is just using uh, a regular SAMX. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. You nice. could also use all. The effect would be the very same. Using okay. all or cross filter none leads to the same result. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So we were both right, MK. You already asked the question in the chat and we both tried to answer. Okay. Now, why don't I see the chat? Um, I have a question oh, too. No, sorry, I see it. I was just, just... okay. Yes, yep. This, it was the only question so far. Okay. Cool. Can, can I uh, ask a question as well? Ask, absolutely. Okay. Um, so um, I have a little data model um, and I uh, I've just drawn a little sketch of it so um, you understand what I'm talking about. Maybe I'll just upload it to the chat if that's okay. Yeah. And um, did you receive the picture? Yes. Okay. So uh, you were talking about the uh, the uh, the difficulties um, with uh, bidirectional cross filtering, but yeah. um, I've been I've been using them quite uh, on a regular basis. Um, in the following scenario, so yeah, if, if you, you take uh, a look I'm, at the picture, I'm looking at it because you have sets and you are basically using them to implement. Yeah, them yeah, in yeah, yeah, yeah. For user convenience, um, I want them to be able to use a slicer to filter um, a distinct subset of um, values in a fact table. Yeah. Now, the thing about a model like this is that it works. So there is nothing bad with the model itself. Huh? Yeah. Uh, let me see what happens if I take this. Uh, Put it here, then share the screen because we are talking. But uh, since the session is being recorded, nobody's seeing the. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. a good idea. Uh, so everything is fine, but uh, the, the the real thing is uh, what happens with the remaining part of the relationship. So let me put it here again. Mm -hmm. If uh, this part of the relationship is uh, the end of a chain. So if there is no incoming relationship to that set table and the set does not filter anything else, that works. There is nothing bad because you are enabled by directional. So this filters this table, this filter this one, but the effect is limited to those two tables. There is nothing, ha nothing else happening. Yeah. The problem of bidirectional cross filter always happens when you have uh, 
uh, scenarios like this one, you enable bidirectional cross filter between two tables, but then both product filters, purchases, and uh, sales fields, fields filter coming from other tables. So if you put a bidirectional cross filter in the middle of a chain of complex relationship in a complex model, then there is where the problem might happen because it's nearly impossible in a real model with 20 or 30 tables to understand the implication of that bidirectional cross filter. But if that okay. happens at the end, so for example, making this relationship by die, the one between sales and customer, that would not be an issue at all. Because you are only affecting the relationship between sales and customer, you are not touching anything else. Making mm -hmm. this yeah. relationship by die, that's a problem. Because uh, that's in the middle of different chains uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a nightmare. Okay, that's what I expected. So <laughs> I uh, made sure to always put them at the end of um, the chain of relationships. Um, but do you know any alternative way to, to get the same result um, that does not include using calculation groups? Because I know you can use calculation items like um, selected. To obtain, uh, uh, to obtain uh, your result, uh, to have yeah, sets. Yeah. Uh, no, but I mean, yeah. your case, I, I'm not here to say that you should stay away from by die. You're using bidirectional cross filter for a very legitimate purpose. So that's fine, use it. Because you want to use bidirectional cross filter, you need to pay the additional price of making sure that there is no ambiguity. So you use by die, you make sure that there's no ambiguity, the model works fine, you're happy. There are no problems with that. What scares me are people that enable by die just because it looks convenient or it's cool or it's a new feature. Let me click on it and see what happens. And what happens is that you are destroying the model. You are turning into a maze of ambiguity that, uh, that's really hard. So yes, you could use calculation group, but in your case, I would use bidirectional. Okay, it's perfect, thank you. I, I use by die on my on many customers. So I'm coming out now. <laughs> <laughs> Further questions? Um, hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hello, hello. It's Mike here. I just have a, a short comment probably. It was always I was asking myself, how can I find if I have a blank row between the tables? And it was like a little bit of pain unless I Discovered the VertiPack uh, analyzer, and there you can see if you have a let's say a blank row, so 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 to say, yeah. if you have yeah. a between a bit between the uh, tables, uh, let's say a blank rows, and so you can easily master it. Yeah, because otherwise it's a nightmare to understand if I created some somewhere blank rows after the next refresh. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's actually simpler than you might expect because uh, there are functions that return the blank row and functions that do not. Namely, you have uh, distinct and values. Mm, distinct okay. does not yeah. return the blank row. Values that. So it's enough to say, well, if I want to know if there is a blank row in product, uh, all what I need to do is uh, check that count rows of values of brand is the same as count rows of distinct of brand. If the two numbers are the same, there's no blank row. If the two numbers are different, the only reason can be the blank row. And so at that point, you know that the blank row appeared and uh, you check it. So you can easily build a dashboard that tells you, hey, there's a blank row in this table because it checks uh, through count rows uh, where the problem might be. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, uh, Thorsten here, also a question. Um, so first of all, big fan of you. So thanks for uh, the, um, Thank you. Uh, yeah, the demo today. Yeah. Um, regarding the picture you have on the screen right now, um, regarding these uh, bidirectional filters. Um, so how would you, uh, well, is there still a possibility to still sync slices in that model? Um, Actually, or would you say yes. I didn't show that, but uh, yes. 
you can usually just a regular one to many relationship. So we go both to single. And now we are in trouble. You see, we have all the colors. And even if I filter Stephanie, I see all the colors. But the thing is, you can go to color, open the filters, and say, well, this should be filtered by where color is all. And I can take sales, put it here, and add the filter. Sales is no, greater than zero. Now, what I'm doing is I'm filtering uh, the color based on the sales measure only when the sales is greater than zero. And if I apply this filter, now you see that color no longer shows all the color, but only the color that have sales. So if I remove the filter, I see everything, uh, and now this changes every time I click on a filter. So I'm able to obtain the same effect uh, without using relying on bidirectional cross filter. Uh, I wrote an article about that, so you can check uh, uh, SQL BI website, uh, where I also give some suggestion on how to build those measures in the more efficient way, because of course you are slow. Alberto? Hello. Yes. Oh, you 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 were frozen. We couldn't hear you. Uh, at least I could not hear you, and your okay. picture was frozen. Okay. I don't know about the other people. You were frozen, no, but um, I got I got the answer. So okay. thanks for that. Yeah, I Great. was basically repeating the same stuff. So, so <laughs> yes, you can obtain the same the same result without uh, reverting to by die. Um, May I, yeah. Do you still have time for another question? Totally. Excellent. So um, I was wondering if you have some um, experiences with the per performance of uh, bidirectional filters. Um, I have a model where I'm using bidirectional filters um, or could use it. Um, for building a many-to-many -many relationships. So I build a many-to-many -many relationships using a bridge table, uh, which contains all the details. And um, I can have the option to bind the outer table with the distinct values yeah. uh, with the bidirectional filters. And then I can write simple measures. Or if I bind them with um, uh, unidirectional filters, I have to uh, wrap them into a calculate that includes the bridge table. Okay. And the question is, um, will I see a difference in performance, um, whether I'm using uh, bidirectional filters or um, include the bridge table via the argument in the calculate function? Do you have they are nearly the same. So using bidirectional cross filter or using uh, a table as a filter to move the filter mm -hmm. provides nearly the same uh, performance. It's not very different. Okay. So no, Keeping, nothing obvious. Yeah, there is a, a, a tiny difference because if you use calculate and then the bridge table as a filter, you are always enforcing the filter. Whereas if you enable bidirectional cross filter, the filter is moved only when needed. And if you do not traverse that relationship for your calculation, then it does not need to pay the price of that filter. So it is slightly better to use uh, bidirectional or use cross filter instead of using uh, the, the bridge table. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, performance wise, they are nearly the same. Keep in mind, moving the filter from the many side to the one side is extremely expensive. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, thanks. We have uh, one more question uh, from Inga. I don't know if you want to ask the question yourself or if I should should read it from the chat. Uh, no, I would just ask you one second because I need to change the battery of the... <laughs> yeah, sure. So it takes one second, but I need to do that. Otherwise, I'll stop hearing you. 
Yeah, I could ans uh, ask the question, Lars. Okay. Okay, here I am again. You hear me? Yes, we do. Perfect. Uh, so, Albert, I have a question regarding the data types of the keys. Uh, I was quite surprised to learn that unique identifiers are not really recognized by uh, the Power BI and the model itself. Yeah, I guess they, they treat them the as strings. Huh? Huh? Yeah, they are converted to strings, so yeah, okay. I was quite surprised. And uh, let's say if we have a SQL Server database uh, model, in the background, like how this behave performance wise, because uh, let's say if we have over 10 or 20 tables, we cannot just um, make up our own kind of keys. Yeah, but the good thing is that uh, the VertiPack engine is uh, nearly, not totally, but really close to be totally data type independent. So you could use uh, uh, an integer, a floating point, uh, a date, a string. Uh, you can actually use whatever data type you want to build a relationship, but also for columns. Uh, and you will notice no difference in performance, uh, meaning that uh, you don't have to worry about using uh, a string or uh, an integer to build a relationship uh, between the two tables, because performance wise, it is absolutely the same. Any column will be dictionary encoded, transformed to an integer internally by the engine, and then only integer math is used everywhere. So you only uh -huh. pay a, a tiny price for the creation of the dictionary, but apart from that, uh, tabular is really totally data type independent. It's only very sensitive to the cardinality of a column. The larger the column, the, the larger the number of distinct values of a column, the slower it is. But okay, so. Also, independently, if it's a direct query mode or imported mode. Oh, no, that's very different. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if we are speaking about direct query, that's a totally different environment. Direct query is mainly SQL. Mm -hmm. So okay. as soon as you have direct query, uh, everything goes, goes to SQL, and there's nothing you can do to improve uh, uh, the tabular engine because uh, it only relies on SQL queries. So you need to make sure that your SQL queries are fast enough Okay, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. No other questions? Uh, yeah, I have another, another question. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, I don't know whether the question is too general, but um, I'm just going to dare to ask it. Um, so, um, what would you, you just said that um, moving the filter from the many side to the one side of relationship is really expensive, yeah. um, which I also noticed. Um, but what uh, would you recommend doing if you have a business requirement where um, you can't avoid modeling a many to many relationship? Um, and uh, additionally, a many to many relationship containing a very large um, bridge table. Um, for instance, uh, I'm working on a model right now um, where I analyze um, the performance of different marketing activities, marketing activities like, um, for instance, sending an email to a, a customer. Yeah. Um, so you have a many-to-many -many relationship between customers and um, emails sent, um, and each email can um, it can be sent to, to I don't know millions of customers. Um, so the bridge table gets really big, really fast. Um, and now there is re another relationship from customers to sales, uh, for example. Um, do you know any way of modeling that, um, except from using a many-to-many -many relationship and um, bidirectional cross-filtering? Actually, no, meaning that either you duplicate the data in the fact table, but yeah, that's yeah, be yeah. A nightmare because it. Uh, if uh, the bridge table is really larger, then that is going to be yeah, extremely I tried large. Yeah, and, and, and it blew up uh, the whole model. Yeah, exactly. So it's not really a matter of size. Uh, you can go to billions of rows in the fact table, and you still don't have performance issues. Uh, whereas on the bridge table, as soon as you reach the million rows, uh, things uh, start to be slow. And if you reach uh, tens or hundreds of millions, uh, then it's extremely slow. But unfortunately, there's no there's no easy way to solve that. 
So it's a price that you need to pay and you typically do. What I would try to do is try to isolate the, the need for the analysis at that level, either on a smaller model or on a specific model that doesn't have so many rows. There's no way. Either you try to reduce the cardinality of, the, of those columns, which in case of emails and sales, you can't, uh, or you pay the price. OK, thank you. Keep in mind that the, the real uh, number that you need to care of uh, is not actually the size of the bridge table, but it's a, it's a selectivity. So you can have a bridge table that contains uh, tens of millions of rows, uh, provided that when you apply a filter in the report, uh, out of the bridge table, you retrieve a few thousand rows. If that happens, so if the selection, if the selectivity of the bridge table is good enough to reduce the number of rows, uh, then performance are not that bad. I have seen a model that contains something like 10 billion rows in the fact table and several hundred million rows in the bridge table, but it was very, very selective. So they made a selection and that turned out to filter very well. It was not fast, so it was not clicky, clicky, draggy, droppy, but it was good enough, like a few seconds to produce a calculation, which with a model of that size is totally reasonable. Okay, yeah, thank you for that hint. You're welcome. Further questions? Looks like you made everyone satisfied. Cool. <laughs> Sounds good. So thank you for attending and uh, well, have a nice night or wherever you are. I have no idea what time is it in Israel right now, but for Europe, it's 8.30. Yeah, same here in Germany. Yeah, thanks a lot, Alberto. Um, was, it was a great session as expected. Uh, thanks to everyone who attended and um, yeah, have a good day. Have a good night. Thank, thank you guys. You. Thank you. you very much. Bye. It was really good. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.